Now, most of you know why decompression sickness is called the bends. Well, because in the old days, before we had tables or good treatment, uh, divers, especially commercial divers and frequent long-term divers would get so much nitrogen bubble accumulation in the joints, especially the spine, that they would get arthritis from the inflammation over time and thus be bent over, and we call it the bends. Most divers won't get that now, but even commercial divers these days who do everything right, often if they're frequent deep divers will report by later on in their career they'll have numb fingertips, various manifestations that may represent little decompression sickness hits along the way that accumulate. But for this audience, which is probably recreational or occasional occupational divers, the odds are you will go through your career without getting decompression sickness, without needing the hyperbaric chamber, and without any significant problems. And that's the hope. Uh, the more you do to keep yourself healthy, uh, hydrated, avoiding alcohol, not flying after diving, following your tables and reporting symptoms early is the best way for you to prevent having arthritis and other tissue damage that may be long term for you. So now let's look at decompression sickness itself. Type 1 and type 2. Basically type 1 is mild, type 2 is more severe or concerning, type 1 is really pain only. Usually we're thinking about the extremities, pain in a joint, pain along a, a tissue plane, uh, something that doesn't appear to be life-threatening, something that should get attention but is not emergent. This would be type 1 decompression sickness. Now, some people will consider that a small numb spot just out in the periphery on the arm, for example, uh, can be called type 1 as well because it's not really a central nervous system condition. It's probably just a peripheral nerve with some bubbles around it that's being tweaked, so to speak. But technically, decompression sickness type 2 is neurological or something to do with the, uh, the critical organs in the center of the body, the heart, the lungs, the middle structures of the chest. So decompression sickness type 2 is more severe and certainly if you have any significant neurological manifestation, be that dizziness, be it uh, problems with the ears uh, that might be related to balance and inner ear decompression sickness, bubbles in the semicircular canals, any of these might be type 2 decompression sickness. Another problem is that type 2 decompression sickness, because it's often neurological, is hard to distinguish from a cerebral arterial gas embolism, which acts like a stroke and gives you central neurological compromise. So sometimes we won't know the difference. Therefore, any significant neurological problem associated with diving needs to get to the chamber quickly. And so here's where we start to think about emergent versus elective as well. So, if a diver has, of course, anything, airway, breathing, circulation, or neurological, central neurological, that's emergent. So, any neurolo serious neurological manifestation needs to get to chamber treatment right away, whether it's type 2 decompression sickness or arterial gas embolism, we just don't know. But, let's say this, if the problem is just basically a type 1 or very minimal peripheral out in the extremities neurological symptom a small numb spot that's really not an emergency and the best thing to do is just call us directly here at Roper Hyperbaric Medicine 724-2014 that's area code 843-724-2014 if you're in the Charleston South Carolina region we can arrange day or night to uh, evaluate you and possibly treat you without going through the emergency room. There's probably no testing that needs to be ordered and we can just save you time and money by getting directly to the treatment. If it's type 2 decompression sickness or anything more serious or you just don't know, then you may want to activate 911, be on oxygen, get to the emergency room, hopefully a Roper emergency room so that they can get you straight to the chamber if we need to do that and treat it more seriously. Now we've gone over uh, triage in the field, emergent versus urgent. We've gone over how to contact us uh, at Roper and to use the after hours call system versus uh, the daytime we're here talk to us system and that's that's a separate video so please watch that again if you 
if you're not familiar with it. Timing of decompression sickness versus, say, arterial gas embolism. Remember, in arterial gas embolism, you're talking about a rapid onset. Usually this is a mechanical bubble of the air that you're breathing, gets into the circulation, quickly shoots to the brain or other vital organ and gives you significant severe symptoms right away, often thought to be within 15 minutes after surfacing from a dive. Decompression sickness is thought to take a while longer to manifest. Why? One, you've got to have time to fizz out significant number of bubbles, just like you're popping a can of Coke, you get that fizz, but this is going to take longer to fizz out those bubbles. Remember, they're seeping out and then they're coalescing in a tissue plane. And then your body's got to have time to respond to it, probably to make that inflammatory response, which may take even more time. So we think 30 minutes or more after dive is typical, although nothing is absolute. But I've had divers to come in a day after diving with what appears to be classic decompression sickness symptoms that didn't appear for a day after diving. I've had divers come back from the Caribbean and not contact us for six, seven days, even though they've had symptoms for several days. We treat them and they get, they get better. So type 1 decompression sickness, we should be in, in touch about it very quickly. We should make a treatment plan and then we decide how urgent versus elective that is, depending on several factors. Whatever it is, we'll take good care of the diver and do our best to get that resolved. One more reason to have your Divers Alert Network insurance or other equivalent specific dive insurance is that sometimes we just don't know if it's decompression sickness or if it's a little uh, sprain or an achy place. So we may treat on a best guess, and it's certainly helpful when you have that supplemental dive insurance because then you're not worried about trying to save a buck. You're just worried about getting better because the insurance is going to take care of that. So don't dive without Dan or equivalent diver's insurance. And finally, the other thing to think about with decompression sickness is to be so aware of if you do have any chronic knee pain, any arthritis, any joint pain, any old muscular sprains that haven't healed right that you ache on days when it's cold so that you know what's normal for you after a dive. Because if you've got pain or any kind of numb spot or any significant symptom after diving that's new or different, even a bizarre flu-like feeling for a while, that may be decompression sickness talking. So the better you know yourself over time and the day of the dive, the better you will be at determining whether something is new or different and summoning help as soon as possible. So I'll stop there with a, one more reminder. If you haven't watched and really absorbed the video on how to access after hours emergency help from our unit, then please do that.